So it's, it's kind of fitting that um, one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with is what got me into quantified self, the idea of using real-time visualizations in order to track the progress of a goal. About four years ago, right after she had her first baby, my sister was diagnosed with cancer. And through chemotherapy and radiation, her immune system got incredibly weakened. And as a result, the doctors said, you cannot see your new baby. And you can imagine as a new mother how devastating that would be. And what they told her was that in order to get her immunity system up, they wanted her to eat a lot and dig in a lot of calories. They actually wanted her to get 1,500 calories per day into her system. Now, as somebody going through chemo and radiation, that's a really challenging thing to do. And they actually wanted her to keep that up for three days in a row. So what they did for her was the doctors and the nurses built a chart in her room where they had her goal, 1,500 calories a day, and every time they gave her a meal, they would keep track of the caloric intake. And you could see it slowly building, 800 calories a day, 900 calories a day, 1,000 calories a day, until after about three weeks, she was able to keep down 1,500 calories a day for three days in a row, and she was able to see her baby. And what I learned from that was the power of not only setting a goal, which is incredibly important, I'm gonna talk about that, but also seeing that real-time visualization, getting that little win in there in order to hit that goal. About 2,500 years ago, Sun Tzu in The Art of War said that in order to know one's enemies, or in order to succeed in war, one should have full knowledge of one's own strengths and weaknesses, as well as those of his, one's enemies. It's the first time that I could find a record of a leader telling his staff, you need to understand what you're good at and what you're bad at and where you stack up against your enemies and your, your associates. Fast forward to the year 1886, and a guy by the name of W.O. Atwater found out that food has energy in it, and it was the basis of the calorie. And in 1896, W.O. Atwater created a machine called the calorie meter. And what that measured was cal caloric intake from food, and it also measured caloric output through exercise. And he, does, he shared with what we all know common, as common sense today, and that is less food going in, more exercise going out, leads to a healthier lifestyle. By the 1920s, the flapper dress was a popular fashion accessory. And women in the United States did what anybody trying to lose weight today does. They count their calories. And they're very systematic about counting the calories, and in this case, to fit into the flapper dress. But that time, the quantified self movement was actually born. Today in the consumer world, quantified self is everywhere. And you can see it in the Nike, the Nike fuel band, the, flex, uh, the, the Fitbit Flex. One of my favorites is the Lumo Lift. And it's a device that you wear on your lapel. And if you start to slouch a little bit, it gives you a little vibration and reminds you to sit up straight. And it's cool when I say that because everybody in the room all of a sudden goes like this and sits up straight. And this is just for fitness. Automobile manufacturers have been taking advantage of quantified self for the last few years giving their drivers a real-time notification on how they're driving to make sure that their fuel efficiency is right. And there's a group of people called hypermilers that compete with one another on how do you get the most fuel-effective car. And you have people getting over 100 miles a gallon in their Priuses. A few months ago, Google acquired a company called Nest. And Nest did the same thing, but for your fuel efficiency in your home. It allowed you to track how you're competing against your neighbors and your friends and people in your city in order to have the most fuel-efficient house. Most of you guys are probably getting online report cards. My son who just gave that introduction, he's getting an online report card on an almost daily basis, and I can see where does he, stank where does, where does he rank amongst his peers. He does stink too, but where does he rank amongst his peers? Um, and I can also get notification on things that I need to be doing for him. And finally, sports has actually been taking advantage of this in the workplace for a long time. If you take a look at somebody like Wayne Rooney and his 300,000 pound per week contract that he gets, he gets that money because of the stats that he has. He gets that money based on how he compares to other people in the organization, and they're keeping track of that in real time. And should he slip, I can almost guarantee that that 300,000 pound a week contract is gonna go away. So another thing that I'm really interested in is zombies. I love zombie movies, zombie books, you know, zombie TV shows. I'm a big zombie fan. And a few years ago in the United States, there was a survey done, and 14% of people said a zombie apocalypse is inevitable. <laughs> so let, let, let's pretend that that's a global survey, and if you look around this room, it's about one in seven people in this room believe that that zombie apocalypse is inevitable. Which, you know, everybody's kind of joking around and kind of chuckling, and that's a fun thing. But the Gallup poll did a survey last year that said 70% of employees at work are disengaged. So that's a crazy number. 70% of employees are disengaged. So it makes that zombie number actually look real. And, and there, there's almost a zombie invasion of people at work. 
And, and if you don't believe me, walk through an airport sometime. Go through airport security and you'll see zombies at work. Pick up the phone and call a call center and you'll get to talk to zombies at work. If you go into a lot of retail establishment, it's zombies at work. And, and the reason that people are disengaged in the workplace is kind of twofold. Number one, there's not a clear sense of goals. People actually don't know what they should be doing, or at least how they should be tracking to what they should be doing. They might have some big, audacious goal, but they don't really necessarily know how to get there. So that's crazy if you think about it. If you're going to go out and run a marathon, right, you know exactly how far you need to run, you know exactly how much you need to eat, you know exactly how much you need to sleep, but when you go to work, do you know exactly what it is that you should be doing in order to hit those goals? The second reason that people are kind of zombified at work is that there's not necessarily a feeling of advancement. Harvard Business Review did a study in 2009 that said the number one motivator for people at work isn't money. It's the feeling of advancement. So goals and advancement, it's a really simple thing to do, but it's a harder thing to put in practice. A few years ago, when Google was founded, in 2003 or 4, I believe, uh, the famous venture capitalist John Doerr pulled Larry and Sergey aside and he started talking to them about goals. And he had seen how important goal setting was and giving a visualization of the real-time status of those goals and hitting those goals and how important that was. He saw that be successful at companies like Intel and at General Electric and at Toyota. And he pulled them aside and he said, I want you to have your employees, and this is when Google was tiny, maybe 50 employees. I want you to have your employees set these goals. And they need to be a little bit uncomfortable, number one, and they need to be very ambitious, number two. Because when you set a really ambitious goal and it puts you out of your comfort zone, that's when magical things are going to happen. But he also said that goals need to be achievable. If I stand up here today and I tell you that I'm going to go to the moon tomorrow, that's my goal, that's never going to happen in a million years, right? I could say it tomorrow, I could say it you know, 10,000 years from now, it's never going to happen. Goals need to be achievable, but if I say I'm going, to, I'm going to make 10 cold calls on Monday morning, that's a very achievable goal, that's something that I can do. It's not ambitious, but it's achievable. He also said that goals need to be quantifiable. And so when I'm setting a goal, that goal needs to be quantifiable. Me going to the moon is pretty black and white. It's you know, a one or a zero. It's not really that quantifiable. But when I say I'm going to make 10 cold calls, that's something that can be quantifiable. And the last thing that he said is that goals need to be gradable. You need to know where you stand. So again, moon is black or white. I'm either getting an A or an F. Um, but if I say I'm going to make 10 cold calls and I deliver seven, maybe that's a C. If I deliver 13, maybe that's an A. So when you set those goals, those are some, th some things to keep in mind. The great part about something like a to-do list is it actually gives you that real-time visualization of where you stand on your goal. If my goal is to drop my son off at football practice, mow the lawn, clean the garage, do all of these different things, every time I tick that box, I'm seeing where I stand against my goal. And maybe there's even a prize at the end of it. Maybe if I do all of those things, I get to go play golf for an afternoon, which is a real treat. I want to get a little esoteric here before I start talking about emotions and the emotions that go into helping you achieve your goals. We're all born, and at some point we're all going to die, but in the middle we're going to do some cool things. And the cool things are driven based on the emotions that we get. So when you're setting goals at work, it's really important to keep in mind the emotions that you want to drive out of people. The first emotion that you want to drive for people when you're setting, helping them set their goals is you want to make people feel smart. Everybody in this room is here today because they want to feel smart. It's an amazing motivator. It got you out of bed this morning because you wanted to come to this event to learn something and become a little bit smarter. The second emotion that you want to think about is success. When you can create an experience that is a little bit ambitious and a little bit uncomfortable, but people can hit that goal, they're going to feel very successful. The third one is social value. I want to feel socially valued. The reason that I want to do these talks is because I want to help people to learn these kinds of things. I want to feel socially valued to you. And finally, the last emotion is structure. I want to make people feel like they're structured in a way that they're going down that to-do list, that they're able to tick the boxes on the things that they want to accomplish. Make people feel smart, make them feel successful, make them feel structured, and make them feel socially valued. Now, it's not a, a, a one-size-fit-all kind of experience. Salespeople want to feel successful. You can drive their motivation by making them feel successful, whereas a call center agent may want to feel smart, or they may want to feel socially valued. They're contributing these things. I talked about companies like Google and Intel and Toyota that have been doing this for years. I want to talk about a couple of other companies that have applied this as a way to get the zombies out of their workplace. Um, number one is Accenture, right? Everybody in this room, I'm assuming, has uh, at least heard of Accenture. Um, 180 some odd thousand employee consulting firm. They applied this kind of real-time visualization inside of their internal social network. 
And when they did this, when they started to apply this goal and started to trigger these emotions, they saw a 20% uplift in adoption of that social network. Now, you can imagine in a company with 180,000 people, a 20% increase in just adoption of these social networks, driving people to feel socially valued, is an incredible ramification on their business. There's an early stage startup out of Washington, D.C. called Contactually. And Contactually applied this into their personalized CRM tool. It's a tool that allows you to keep contacts with people, both personal and, and professional uh, associates. And they applied this kind of grading format into that experience. So when I talked to the founder of the company, a guy called Zevi Brand, what he told me was that adding this into their application was the kick in the ass that people needed in order to use their application more effectively. The third company is another startup out of Palo Alto, a company called BetterWorks. And BetterWorks actually works with global 500 companies in order to help make the goals tra more transparent in the organization and give these real-time visualizations to all of the employees, from the CEO down to the very newest intern. Everybody knows exactly what everybody should be doing and how they're each stack ranked. And I talked to the COO of a, of a customer of BetterWorks, a company called Edmonds, and the COO told me that, yeah, the transparency is great, but what it's also brought to the company is a new level of empathy. When I'm successful, I can see who else I'm making successful. But if I fail, I get to see all of the people that I'm actually letting down. And it's changed the way that their business works. Now, like I said, on the surface, this is pretty easy. You set some goals, and you give some real-time visualizations, and you help people feel advancement. But in practice, it's pretty hard. But as we, the thing that I would encourage you to think about today is how do you set these small rewards? How do you set these little tiny wins for your staff and the people that you work with in order for them to accomplish more? Because I believe that when you do that, not only can you help overcome a, a disease like cancer like my sister did a few years ago, but you can also get the zombies out of the workplace. Thank you very much.